Hi, this is Louie McCurley, the chair of Z459.1. I'm just getting ready for the webinar here. It's about uh, eight minutes away or seven minutes away, so we'll just wait a few minutes and let people uh, let people have time to get here. Just make yourself comfortable and get uh, familiar with the online application. If uh, you want to ask a question in GoToWebinar, just type it into the uh, into the, the screen on your right. There's a an active uh, message bar there. If you'd like to just type it in there, I can answer your questions as we go along. Uh, feel free to type things in there. Otherwise, for the moment, we'll just stay on mute and stay on hold for a little while and. Uh, We'll start the webinar at exactly 11 o'clock Mountain Time. Thanks.
Hi, this is Louie. We are about two minutes out from starting the webinar, so um, just make yourself comfortable. We'll start it right at 11 o'clock Mountain Time. Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to just get to know the GoToWebinar system, if you're not accustomed to it, there's a taskbar on your right-hand side that it's a little dashboard, and it there, in one spot on there, it gives you the opportunity to ask questions. So if you have any questions during the course of the webinar today, just uh, type them into that question bar and I will be happy to answer the questions as we go along. So just a couple of minutes now, we'll get started. I'm gonna put myself back on mute. All right, it is 11 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this webinar is intended to answer any questions that people might have on the uh, ANSI ASSP Z459 rope access document that has recently been submitted for uh, final reconsideration. And this document is under the auspices or under the direction of Z359 uh, the, the NFP, sorry, the ASSP ANSI Committee Z359 is the secretariat who is responsible for the document. Z459 is simply the title. And um, so that is, this document has recently gone out for reconsideration. And so as part of that, I was requested to uh, just spend a little bit of time today uh, providing information to to anyone who might want or need it uh, regarding where we're at with the document, questions that you might have, that kind of thing. Sorry about that, I've messed up my screen here. Um, I'll just resume that slideshow. And uh, so if you have any questions or want to discuss anything or talk about anything, just let me know and we'll be uh, happy to get you that information. I have no idea why this isn't working right. Um, I'm having a hard time with my, there we go, I think I fixed it. So here we are. Um, the Z459 document, as I said, is under the direction of ANSI Z359 committee. This standard is the first in the United States that is intended or designed specifically to ad address rope access, at least from an ANSI standpoint. And it's really the culmination of more than 20 years petitioning the Z359 uh, committee to include rope access in the fall protection code. Uh, we, uh, this um, the, the first question that comes up with this is why do we want why not have a standalone standard why do we want to be part of the overall Z359 document instead of just having a standalone standard and doing our own thing and and the answer to that is that um, for us rope access technicians that would probably be a great solution but in the great big world of of work work at height and fall protection uh, the best way to get acceptance and collaboration and, and uh, really just cross utilization of rope access across the broader spectrum of industries really is to include it in the fall protection code. In the United States, ANSI Z359 has long been recognized as the go-to resource for fall protection of all sorts. So by being included in the ANSI Z359 uh, family of standards, ANSI Z459 
uh, immediately is in a stronger position as far as acceptance by by other people, by safety directors, by people who are doing work at height and fall protection. Um, secondly, by being part of the Z359 uh, family of documents, we're kind of forced to harmonize our work in rope access with other types of fall protection. And as you guys know, in fall protection or in rope access, you're constantly moving in and out of different kinds of fall protection. And, and so harmonizing the requirements is, uh, is the beginning of gaining that acceptance, both from an individual standpoint for the uh, safety directors and corporate managers out there, but also for OSHA and for the regulatory people in, in both the federal state and the state and regional uh, and even local levels. So that's really why we've worked so hard to get Z350 or Z459 into the Z359 family. Um, I've spent, as I said, about 20 years trying to get it included. I've represented the Z359 committee to the ISO descender and rope access standards for a number of years. And prior to 2007, um, put in just numerous efforts at trying to get a Z350 or trying to get a rope access uh, chapter into the Z359 family. Um, and when that didn't work, we tried to just reference the ISO standard. And um, when that didn't work, we uh, tried to reference the SPRAT standard. And when that didn't work, we finally managed to get a few paragraphs into the 2007 version of Z359.2, which is the Comprehensive Managed Fall Protection Program standard. Um, and that was really our, our toe in the door in 2007 to get people to really understand what rope access is. We've also worked very hard to uh, familiarize people in the industry with rope access, inviting them to classes, to jobs, to work sites, um, and that's that's really been instrumental. Prior to 2007, um, it was just a matter of beating the drum, and then finally in 2014, uh, we had a, a new scope balloted. And really the key to all of this was we really learned in the fall protection community that one of the big concerns about having a Z359 rope access standard was that people might get Z359 marked equipment and that was really for rope access and they might use it in other types of fall protection. So as we know, the Z359 family of standards that's directed at fall arrest, positioning and restraint is very much designed to be a, a equipment plug and play standard kind of philosophy. So if you use the right equipment and then, then you can't get hurt, it's really not as training intensive as rope access. And so when we fit, when, when we learned that, one of the Z359 members said, well, why don't we just call it Z459? And then we can allow rope access to have a much stronger training basis and still harmonize between the two standards. So um, as, as we learned that and, and progressed in that direction, that's really what allowed us to have a standard at all. Uh, this standard was finally balloted uh, in 2017, and uh, and then over the last couple of years, we've been making revisions to that document. When it was balloted to the Z359 committee, um, we actually had a 90% voting uh, return, which is phenomenal. Uh, it's pretty much unheard of to get 90% of the committee members voting uh, on a given standard. Um, of that, we had 76% of those who did vote uh, voted affirmative and 24% voted negative. There were 12 people. Um, and then there were about 398 comments submitted by a total of 23 commenters. Some of those affirmatives were, were comments, um, uh, affirmative with, with comment, just not a negative, but they still had some really good points. And so we really, decided that even though technically it kind of passed, right, with a 76% a affirmative rate, technically it, it was okay, but but there was just really a lot that definitely needed to be fixed. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Some of the things that we we did fix, some of the things that um, are, are left the way they were for whatever reason, and uh, then I'd like to entertain your questions. And as I said at the beginning of the webinar, there is a dashboard on the right-hand side of your screen, and in it there's a um, place where you can type questions. And if you want to type your question into 
the that box, I'll be able to see it, and I'll be happy to answer that uh, as we as we go along. So, so most of the common issues that caused the negative vote was consistency of terminology, uh, both within the document, uh, consistency inside of itself, as well as consistency between Z359 and Z459. There were also just a boatload of editorial revisions. Um, one of the big things was when we first put the Z3, Z459 document together, we used the term or equivalent a lot. Um, you must have a Z359 uh, harness or equivalent, and, and that didn't go over very well. It was like it's, it either is or it isn't. Standards should be more black and white than that, so we removed all of the uh, equivalents. And then, and then there's just a lot of extra stuff in the document. You know, is it really necessary to describe what um, what a, a horizontal traverse is, or is it really necessary to describe uh, some of the techniques and methods or whatever? And we decided as a committee that for now we'll go ahead and leave those in because there there's still a lot of people who don't understand rope access don't really know what it is or uh, aren't super familiar with it so for their benefit we went ahead and left those things in so the purpose of the z459 effort First, it's a standalone document. It's written in the spirit of the original Z359.1 document, which included everything. It it is you know you know you know now the Z359 standard is broken out into a separate chapter for connectors and harnesses and uh, training and just everything has its own chapter. Um, why didn't we do that with Z459? Well, it's not quite ready yet. Um, we might eventually have to do that. I sure hope not. I sure hope we can keep it simple, but it, there's a chance that we might have to have to actually break it out later. But for now, um, it's, it's a standalone document, much in the spirit of Z359.1. And that was the directive handed to us by the Z359 committee when they said to do this. They said, you know, write this new standard and write it in the spirit of the original Z359. Secondly, we were directed to harmonize to the best of our ability with Z359. So with the standard fall protection code, um, we wanted to write rope access so that it maintained uh, just a, a consistent context with the comprehensive managed fall protection program as it's, as it's outlined in the Z359 family of standards. So that was our starting point. Here's our... our uh, Excuse me, here's our uh, table of contents. So you can see that, that we have in section three, we have program requirements, system requirements, and component and element requirements. So all of those requirements are in for everything are in this document. There's also testing in section four. There's marking and instructions in section five, uh, inspection in section six, rigging and training in section seven, and then uh, references are in all the documents. But you can see that between sections three and six, or three and seven actually, um, in the Z359 family of standards, they've got de separate standards to deal with a great many of those things. And, and again, in this case, it's all combined into the one document. Scope of the document is to set forth accepted practices for rope access work. Um, and it's applicable for use in any environment. So unlike uh, a lot of people really felt like previously in the, the fall protection committee, a lot of people had the perception that rope access is what window cleaners did. And they thought, well, you know, well, there's already a standard for window cleaning. Well, the reality is, is that, that uh, rope access goes beyond window cleaning. It's not industry specific. It can be used in any environment. It's a method of work. It's a method of protection, just like fall arrest or positioning or restraint. So that's rope access. Rope access is defined in the standard um, as consistent as possible with all the different other standards that are out there. Um, and, uh, and then also it was noted that OSHA used the term industrial rope access in their subpart D document. So for clarity, we actually added the, the phrase, you know, it's sometimes it's also called industrial rope access. So uh, this concept of rope access and kind of wrapping, wrapping people's heads around what it is, is a key aspect of all of this. 
We wanted to make a stronger differentiation between rope access and rope descent systems. Again, speaking of OSHA, OSHA has um, in their subpart DNI rewrite in 2016, they, they did talk about both rope access and rope descent systems. And in talking about rope descent systems, they largely used the IWCA I-14 uh, standard as a reference. Now that standard doesn't exist anymore. It's not, it's actually an inactive document. It's been rescinded, but but they used a lot of the concepts that are in, in that document as they understood rope descent systems. And one of the, the main differentiations that, uh, that really kind of came to light was that rope access is really a fully interchangeable system. Uh, like the guy on the bottom who's got the, the camera and the red helmet on, he's using a rope access system because they're two ropes, they're fully interchangeable systems. Whereas the guy in the upper left hand or the center photo, um, he's using a rope descent system because it's not an interchangeable system. He's using an SRL uh, attached to his dorsal attachment point and he's descending on uh, a, a rappel device on his, his front uh, harness attachment. And so that would really be considered rope descent. So that was a pretty important part of this effort was differentiating between those two. So again, that backup system being completely interchangeable is one of the key aspects or one of the key elements that um, uh, defines rope access. The backup system and the progress system uh, should be completely interchangeable. Again, looking at that same picture, those two same pictures, we see the, the difference between the backup systems, the, the RDS, the rope descent system on the left, the rope access system on the right. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we wanted to differentiate between simple and complex. So we used the simple and complex definitions or concepts as they were written into the ISO standards some years ago. And the simple, uh, the, the concept between simple and com complex is simple is more or less vertical. Simple is pretty much up and down where, where you have an easy access and egress at both the top and the bottom of the, the area where you're working. And a site becomes complex when you have long deviations or you have um, a, a bottom or a top where access or egress cannot be attained. So, so that's really the differentiation. For backup devices, um, we had to borrow the Z359 test method. So it's, it really is the Z359 test method with some additional requirements added to it. Um, and so that, that kind of helped keep the, the uh, Z359 folks more comfortable with the capabilities of that backup device. Um, and then work, worrying also about the rescue load. This is a, a first in any of these standards. None of the standards really have any requirements for rescue load test methods. And, uh, and so we had to add that into this if we were going to allow people to do uh, pickoff type tests, uh, 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 rescues. Harness requirements, again, Z359.11 is specified as a baseline. There's an additional requirement for ventral and sternal attachments. Um, so although 0.11 allows ventral and sternal attachments, it doesn't require them. Whereas to be a rope access harness, you absolutely have to have a ventral and sternal attachment uh, in order to accommodate the, the rope access. So there is an additional requirement there for the Z459 harness. Screw links are another thing that <clears throat> are kind of a no-no in the Z359 family of standards. And we did allow that in the Z459. Um, it was not put in as an exception. We didn't say, oh, screw links are forbidden for everybody except rope access technicians. Instead, we said uh, screw links may be used in certain capacities. Uh, but not as a typical connector that is moved and removed throughout the course of work. Um, we wrote it in in the same way that the standard on retractables wrote it in. It's an integral connection. That is, a tool is required to attach it and remove it. So in essence, as a rope access technician, you simply need to tighten your screw link uh, with uh, a tool and uh, so that it can't be finger loosened 
and uh, and then we did kind of revise it a bit based upon some some comments, but it's tested uh, as an oval ring, not with the same exact requirements, but uh, in that manner, it's tested as an oval ring because that's essentially how we're using it. All the marking is to ANSI Z459.1. So if something is Z3, uses Z359 as a baseline, but also uses uh, has some additional requirements from a Z459 standpoint, uh, it's still marked Z459. Now that doesn't mean that if equipment isn't marked Z459, you can't use it as an employer. This is a voluntary consensus standard. So as an employer or as a technician, you can choose to use equipment that you believe is as good as or better than, uh, you just need to justify that to the, the OSHA inspector or whoever it is that is using the standard um, in, in context with you. And then finally, um, there's some stuff about competency. Um, there's a lot actually in the rope access in the Z459 standard about competency. As a minimum, a rope access technician using simple systems has to be trained and qualified uh, in accordance. And we use the ISO rope access code of practice uh, as a baseline. And the reason we did that is because we weren't allowed to use the SPRAT or IRATA or anybody else's industry specific uh, brand. We couldn't really say you have to be SPRAT certified or IRATA certified or IRAA certified or SRAA certified. Uh, that's something that, that ANSI doesn't allow any more than they allow me to say that you have to use PMI rope. So, so instead we built the outline and said, uh, you have to have these baseline capabilities. So now I'm gonna open up the standard. I'll open up the document. And um, so far, nobody has actually asked any questions. So I will consider that uh, to, to mean that perhaps there aren't a whole lot of questions regarding the standard as it's been balloted. But right now, um, the standard is out for ballot for reconsideration. I'm gonna show you the two column version. The two column version is uh, the one that has all the markups in it. It's actually presented to the committee as a one column document or a single column document because that's how ANSI does things now. But when we first started this standard, they did it, uh, they actually used a two column format. So we went through all of the revisions and the work in the standard using the two column format, and then we switched it to the single column format for this final bit. So here's the, uh, Here's the standard, and I'm just going to kind of run through some of the key changes that we made and uh, in case anybody has specific questions. So let me get down here to what it is. Um, change the term. Um, no, no, we just capitalized some things there, so there's nothing really huge there. Um, again, a lot of this is grammatical. A lot of this was just specific um, comments that had come in regarding the previous version. Uh, the primary system and the backup system are have, been, have had a number of names throughout the course of, of this writing. And right now they're called the progress system and the backup system. Um, so it's a rope access progress system and the rope access backup system. And I'll bet that even if you aren't a rope access technician, you can probably figure out which is which. And again, a key aspect is that the progress system and the backup system should be interchangeable or um, easily reversible one to another. That's a lot of these changes. Um, we did keep in the hazard zone. I think Sprat may be getting rid of the hazard zone, but um, or renaming some things, but that's all kind of still in there. We tried to be as consistent as possible, again, with the existing rope access uh, standards that are out there, but more importantly, actually, with the ANSI Z359 family of standards, uh, because that's the, the committee that is voting on this thing, and that's the committee that, um, that, that oversees the fall protection family of standards in this country. So, uh, we did define rope access technicians. Somehow we got through 20 years of work without ever having to define a rope access technician until this last version, and somebody finally noticed that we didn't have a, de uh, a definition for that person. So we, we did define a rope access technician. I think this is the only document that, uh, that probably does that at this time. Um, let me just make sure that we're, yep, we're still on the same page here. 
All right, and everything else, you see a lot of numbering there. Um, uh, again, the, the simple work site is unaffected by any adjacent worker trades. The anchor lines follows a simple path from anchor point to ground or platform level. There is no requirement to pass knots or deviations and um, where rescues can be carried out directly to ground or platform. So that's the simple work site. The complex work site is a work site where the requirements for a simple work site cannot be met for reasons including but not limited to other works that might affect the rope access technician, extraordinary environmental, effector, environmental factors, line deviation exceeding 20 degrees, or um, access and egress being encumbered or unavailable. Um, again, these, these uh, definitions are simply definitions. It's left to the employer having jurisdiction, <clears throat> excuse me, to determine uh, which is which. So it's it's left to your discretion to decide which kind of work site and which kind of technicians you feel like you need. Um, so again, the document uh, has a variety of simple changes in there. Um, so as we go through here, I'm not going through it line by line because you guys, um, this is a, a subcommittee committee conference call so hopefully you guys all have copies of the standard in front of you if you have any specific questions I would request that you simply ask those questions in the right hand column of your uh, your dashboard there and uh, type your question in and I'll answer it otherwise this is going to go pretty quick um, let's see Average arrest force no greater than 900 pounds. Again, that's pretty consistent with the ANSI processes as they currently are. Backup systems, um, backup anchor systems. A point of note on elements and components uh, is that where the requirements of another standard are equivalent to the requirements of this standard, you might want to use equipment marked to that standard instead. That's that point that we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago when I had the PowerPoint slide up there uh, talking about how things are called to be marked Z459, but we know that a lot of manufacturers aren't going to be able to do that just because there's only so much space on a carabiner or a descender or whatever. So again, as the authority having jurisdiction, you've got some latitude there to, to do what you think is the right thing to do. Uh, we're trying to, to do as much as we can to to define and make allowances and at the same time um, uh, give people parameters to work within so that they know so people know what rope access is and how to evaluate it there's some testing uh, requirements there's a lot of testing requirements in here uh, underwriters laboratories sat on the subcommittee which was great on the main committee um, there's UL as well as ISA ISEA and a number of other test labs it's super helpful to have their input in the uh, ANSI process and so they gave some excellent inputs to the test methods that we opted to put in here. Again most of the test methods do follow the existing ANSI standards um, so we do try to, to use that as a baseline where possible uh, but some place it can't, places it can't be done for example uh, in the case of uh, handle descenders, for example. We use handle descenders in rope access, but of course there is not an ascender standard in the Z359 family of standards, so we had to write our own. We actually ended up taking it largely from EN. There is a helmet requirement in here. It's not a uh, ANSI Z359 or 459 marking. It, this is the one thing that has a marking that is to a completely different standard and it's ANSI Z89. Um, so it's uh, it's the first time a helmet has been specified for any of the fall protection family of standards. So that's kind of a, a, nice, a nice thing to include. So aside from that, this is a, a webinar rather than a, a meeting that's so all you guys are on mute and um, that's kind of automatic in the system. That's not something I can change in the system. So if you have questions, please do type them into the dashboard and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, I'll uh, keep meandering through the document here and we'll uh, 
I'll point out anything that is unique or extraordinary, and then I will look and see if you have any questions, and then we'll just finish up here. So for the fall arrest standard for the, the backup device, um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is we had to have a standard or a test for a two-person device. Now, it's not required that you have to use a two-person device. If your methods dictate using only uh, methods for rescue that involve a single person on each line or uh, nobody ever backed up to another person's system, then of course you can use just a, a single person uh, backup device. If you have a system or you specify a system that is going to require a two-person load being backed up by one backup device, then it should meet this backup device requirement. So um, we actually had initially a single 485 uh, sorry about that. We had a single 485 pound test weight at one time and ended up splitting it into two test weights so that you have the, the sort of simultaneous impact uh, that's offset by a microsecond or two. Uh, and that's how, the, that's how that's tested. So if you want to look at that, I don't know if anybody's actually testing to it yet. I kind of doubt it because this hasn't been published yet. But I know most of the manufacturers um, PMI, Petzl, CMC, uh, all sat on this, the committee, so I know they're all aware of this and are probably, uh, at least in their in their own laboratories, working on it. So other than that, these are marking requirements, um, inspection, inspection and storage. Of course, we have to comply with manufacturer's instructions. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, get down here to the end. And this is, here it is, the rigging and training. Rigging and training will probably eventually be broken out into a separate standard. It'll be a separate document eventually. Right now there is some training specified in the ANSI Z359.2 Comprehensive Managed Fall Protection document. Um, the training that is specified in this document goes much further than that. That was always the intent. The point two was simply a space holder or a, a placeholder uh, to acknowledge the inclusion of rope access as a viable method of fall protection. Training and training, there are some um, uh, prerequisites, and the prerequisites are that you have to have fall protection knowledge, and um, and then the knowledge requirement for a person using simple systems is much more basic than the requirements for a person using complex systems. And so we get down to complex here and you'll see that the requirements for a person using complex systems as a baseline, they have to meet everything that a person using basic systems must use. And um, and then some additional requirements as well. Now, these requirements are not necessarily completely harmonized with the SPRAT requirements. There's two reasons for that. Um, one is SPRAT very recently changed their requirements. Um, and two is that their, SPRAT doesn't use the simple and complex uh, language that that this document uses. So um, with that in mind, you can probably be quite sure that even the most basic of SPRAT training requirements or SPRAT certification will very likely uh, um, meet the complex requirements from an ANSI standpoint. So so that kind of brings us to the end of the document. Um, there are some some test diagrams in there that uh, most of you guys probably don't really care much about. Uh, again, I'm sure you have your own copies of the standards and are looking at that. So, um, so if there are no questions, and I'm just going to look here again real quick, check my chat box. I'm going to check my question box and I don't see any questions that anybody might have. So that pretty much brings us to the end of our presentation today. 
uh, thank you guys for attending. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, contact me directly. If you have any concerns that uh, that aren't addressed in here, certainly let me know. And um, other than that, thanks for attending, and we'll see you at uh, at the upcoming meeting.